starting more or less where I left, which is we're interested in almost minimal sets. Uh, almost minimal sets are the guys that are defined uh, above. So you said the set is always going to be called E, and a competitor would be F. F would be a competitor in a ball, and there is this main property here that the host of measure of a set in the ball cannot be much larger than a comp host of measure of any competitor, okay? And uh, there is something that I meant to say, but I usually always say, and then surprisingly, not yesterday. Uh, when you're doing competitors, you deform, and deforming does not mean that you cannot pinch. And in fact, one of the main things that you do when you try to find better competitor is pinching. So for instance, if you know you're, uh, you had a set like this, right. okay. uh, this should not be uh, very good, uh, this should not be almost minimal, because uh, with a picture that I have here, there is a better competitor, which is just a <coughs> union of two disks, one here, one there, and a wire in the middle, okay? And the way you see that the red thing is a competitor for the white thing is you essentially uh, pinch everything here and then project on the disk along this direction, right? Uh, or if you prefer, when I pinch here, I can do it all the way to here, but I will have to include the two disk here. So if a measure of a two disk is smaller than the measure of this thing here, you get a better competitor, and that's a way of saying that my initial white thing was not almost minimal, at least not with a small function h at that time. Okay, right. Uh, if the disks were larger, uh, there would be a better competitor, but which would be the one we've seen before? Right. Uh, this would also, uh, sorry, so you have to imagine what I'm doing here, <coughs> but uh, you know some of the part is hidden here. So middle disk uh, full here, and then two sides here. This would could be shorter too, this one we've seen, okay? All right, so that's for definitions. Uh, so what do, uh, so I have a certain number of remarks that I just, and then, uh, just reminding you of, of things. The first thing is that it's important to know how you do your counting of host of measure, but the most important thing usually in these sort of problems is to make sure you understand what is the set of competitors for a given uh, problem. So that's number one. I suddenly have, again, the fact that the definitions that I'm giving are close to the definitions that were given by Armgren and Taylor for more or less the same reasons. Uh, there are lots of different ways of organizing definitions. So what I, do, what I did is I tried to find something which was reasonably simple. Uh, but, okay, many, many, many sets of definitions are essentially equivalent so let's just not, not worry, okay? Uh, I don't know, yeah, I should probably have said that before, but uh, for instance, minimizers of the Reifenberg homology problem satisfy this condition, so it's not only uh, potential solutions of my preferred pr plateau problem that would be almost minimal sets. Almost minimal sets also uh, contained more uh, people than that. Uh, same thing for the supports of size minimizers, as soon as you prove that they exist. Okay, so that's not so bad. And uh, again, I claim that uh, this is supposed to give uh, the best description I know of soap films uh, to be taken with a grain of salt. Okay. Right, and I'm supposed to start giving you simple examples of almost minimal sets, and I'll try to read uh, so maybe I'll put myself and I'll read on my screen. So uh, when uh, the dimension is one, uh, in fact, the minimal sets of dimension one, they're just this, I'll call this a line. Uh, imagine three equal angles uh, here. So this I will call a Y, and I will just put it like this, right? 
And this is minimal. Uh, if you try to deform this and get something better, you cannot. And the angle, again, here comes from the fact that if you try to distort by moving the central point, uh, you have to have a point where the derivative is zero, and this forces the 120 degree angle. And in fact, these are exactly the only non-empty minimal sets in Rn that can exist. Okay. Again, this is not minimal, and the reason why it's not minimal is, for instance, because uh, you know, just do a competitor in this ball, try to do something reasonable, and I guess a uh, typical thing that you would do, I'm sort of lost, so for instance, you can pinch here. Mm? I'm surprised because I thought something like this should work. And if I did my job more correctly, you would see 120 degree angles. And anyway, I don't do anything really uh, clever. I just pinch here and then notice that once it's pinched, I can try to improve uh, the situation. Okay. Uh, what did I have? Uh, so this is, I think, everything for one dimensions, for two dimensions, planes. You're not surprised. Uh, what I call Y set with a bold Y is uh, the product of a set Y here by a vertical line coming this way, or the union of three half spaces, and that's fine. Uh, there is a set T, and I, there will be a picture in a second, so it's the cone of our, uh, something about uh, tetrahedrons, but you know, this is the Y and this is the T. Okay. Uh, right, so where am I in my description? Y is T's, and, uh, and then afterwards I have other types of examples. This, this, uh, what I gave you is in fact the total list of uh, sets for which we know they are minimal in the whole space, and it's suddenly the list of minimal cones, and cones are important in this business. Okay. Now, uh, the next ones are more local, so catenoids. So uh, this is not really a catenoid, uh, but imagine something like this, right? And probably there will be a picture next. So, or any other things people call minimal surfaces are going to be almost minimal sets. Uh, but usually it's locally that it happens. Okay? So for instance, a catenoid would look like this. Uh, in fact, it more looks like a fatter version. So let's say this will be my picture of a catenoid. Uh, okay. And I'm saying it's essentially not minimal because uh, at this scale, this will do better. Okay. But uh, for small radius r, so if you take just h of r is equal to, uh, I don't know, 0 for r less than 1 over 10, and then h of r is equal to plus infinity everywhere else, it's uh, almost minimal with this, uh, the uh, gauge function. <laughs> okay. And then I have the expected thing, which is that I hope it's a good description of, of soap films, soap bubbles, and so on and so forth. Okay. That's okay. the set. So this is a catenoid. Okay. And again, this one is probably already starting not to be minimal with a given boundaries. Okay, right. Um, this is a uh, last precaution that I am taking. So in fact, I mean, already you've seen, the, I mean, I'm just addressing a problem that we've talked about this morning, which is if you take a nice set and you add a countable set to it or some really horrible, even close set, but of measure zero, you still get a minimal set if you started from a minimal set. But we want a nice description of minimal sets, so we want to get rid of this extra set that you could add. Okay, so that's what I'm doing in this slide. I'm saying I start from a set, I look at uh, what I call its core, which is just the support of Hostoff measure on that set. So for instance, on this red set here, the core would be just the union of the two disks, and this uh, guy here uh, does not support host of measure of dimension two, so it disappears, okay? And what I'm saying in this slide is that I might as well just forget about it. So again, 
for the descriptions, for instance, if, you, if you're thinking about trying to solve a plateau problem, the red part here is important because it tells you something about the topology. What I'm saying in this slide is that if this set here is minimal, then when I remove the red part, I still get a minimal set. It's not in the same category in topology as you had before. But first, I will study the regularity of a, uh, of a reduced part, I mean the coral part, E star. Uh, I'll prove some estimates. And then later on, if it's needed, I will return to the extra piece here to talk about topology. But in fact, the later on, the later on will not hap happen today right? or this week. So uh, again, this is just some way so that I can say, if I have an almost minimal set, I just look at its, uh, I, uh, I, I say, I, I look at its uh, core. I say it's al also almost minimal with the same constants. And I study the regularity of that guy. And then afterwards, uh, we'll see what happens. OK? So from now on, all my almost minimal sets will be reduced or coral, which means I don't care about the extra piece. OK? I have a question. Yeah? For the previous slide, um, so in the bottom, you have E star uh, minus E. Sorry, uh, I mean E uh, minus E star. <laughs> I dearly hope it's the only <laughs> error in my in the slides. But OK, you know, you're right. Yeah. So uh, again, yeah, the, 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 the little red part here might have some topological interest, but I just throw it out. OK? And so for instance, here I will say that the union of those two disks is alpha regular satisfies some other properties. And I will not say anything about the wire. In fact, the wire here, I drew the best, most beautiful one that I could find. But of course, you know, if you just draw a set of uh, dimension one like this, it's going to have exactly the same measure. It's going to be equally, I mean, I, I don't control the, the red part. I mean, the, the green part. OK. So, uh, so again, from now on, I'm uh, only looking at uh, almost minimal sets that are reduced. And what I'll try to do is explain a certain number of results of regularity, low regularity for those things. Uh, most of them are true, including at the boundary, which was my initial goal. But the proofs are easier, so uh, are easier when you're far away from the boundary. So I will just now consider myself far away from the boundary. Okay? And I'll try to, to give proofs of various things. And the list, the initial list is here, alpha regularity, rectifiability, uniformly rectifiable, uh, uniform rectifiability, big projections. And then uh, afterwards, we'll talk about limits. OK? Let's start. So alpha regularity is this thing here. Uh, so again, you take a point of a support. And on a ball centered on the, the support, the host of measure of a ball is comparable to R to the D with some constants. That, in our case, will, not, will depend only on the dimension and uh, will be satisfied as long as the gauge function H at R is not too large. Right. OK. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, I tend to forget. I, I'll do as if uh, I was working on the whole space. And in my slides, I'm apparently doing it on an open set. And if I'm working on an open set, I will just take balls that are contained in the open set. OK. Right. And I'm saying there is an easy part and a hard part. And actually, the, not, the, the easy and hard is not so clear. But as in co-dimension one, that's what's happening. Um, uh, let's say the logical thing is that the Hostorf measure should never be too large because you would imagine that this is going against being uh, almost minimal or minimal. Uh, this part here, you'll have to say that if the set is too thin, it was essentially useless. That's the idea. Okay? Or you could contract it even more. OK, right. Uh, so uh, I hesitated. And in, in fact, I'll give you more statements first and then more proofs later as opposed to just little by little. So the second thing that I'm going to talk about is uniform rectifiability. And I don't want to insist so much on uniform rectifiability itself. Uh, so it's a quantified version of rectifiability. So for me, rectifiable will really mean 
we are always having locally finite Hostoff measure, so it's not uh, uh, counterable anything. So we are looking at a set with locally finite Hostoff measure, and it's rectifiable if it can be covered by a countable number of either Lipschitz images or C1 images or C1 surfaces of dimension D uh, plus a set of measure zero. Okay? Right. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and uniform rectifiability is uh, something that looks like this, but more uh, uniform. So instead of asking, for instance, for many pieces to cover the set, we ask for a control number of pieces, or just one. And uh, instead of having Lipschitz mappings, we ha ask for Lipschitz mappings with a given bound. And that's uh, one of the definitions of uh, uniform rectifiability. So I always l be looking at Alphos regular sets because my sets will be Alphos regular. And uh, I'd say that it's uniformly rectifiable when there is some constant, so that whenever you pick a ball uh, centered of a set, you can find a Lipschitz mapping from the unit ball, let's say, of RD, or let's say the ball of radius. Uh, where do I have it? It, oh, yeah, okay. It's uh, essentially the best is to define it on the ball of center zero and radius r, the same radius. Lipschitz mapping, m Lipschitz, and you want the intersection of a set with the image of that ball to be large. Okay, larger than some number times r to the d. Okay? Just a way, I mean, I essentially took the definition up there and you know, asked for a single piece of not so small size. And here, this thing says that the, uh, our set E contains big pieces of Lipschitz images. There are other definitions I don't want to insist so much. OK? Right. Uh, maybe there is one thing that I should say, uh, because otherwise I will forget. Uh, Alphos regular doesn't seem to be so much of a property. Uh, yet, I when you don't have it, uh, things are much more unpleasant. OK? Uh, with Alphos regularity, for instance, this is just a uh, simple uh, thing, uh, rectifiable sets are known to have uh, approximate tangent planes almost everywhere. And in principle, if I wanted to, to be very nice, I would tell you what is an approximate tangent plane. In fact, if a set is Alphos regular, uh, approximate tangent planes are auto automatically true tangent planes. So that I wouldn't have to worry about little fuzzy sets and density is going around, OK? But many little things like this happen when, as, as soon as you know that you're Alphos regular. So it's very convenient to work with anyway, even if, again, it does not look so much like you know, strong regularity property, OK? Right. And yeah, the theorem that goes with it is, uh, so I, I'm going to prove uh, regularity anyway couldn't prove uniform rectifiability because it, uniform rectifiability because it didn't exist at the time, uh, and essentially I'm saying that the sets that we're talking about are uniformly rectifiable. Okay, I will probably comment more on that. Uh, this one will not be able to prove. Uh, it looks very nice. We were very happy with it because we like uniform rectifiability. It seems to me now that it is not as important as we thought it would be. And I'll discuss that a little later, OK? And uh, there is a little bit more which is written on the bottom of a slide, but I'm not sure it is so important. Not only the sets are uniformly rectifiable, but they also have big pieces of Lipschitz graphs, uh, which is a little stronger property. Don't necessarily pay too much attention to it. So again, instead of Lipschitz images, it would be Lipschitz graphs uh, that would have big intersections. Uh, and this is a little stronger than the other one, and the difference is having big projections, and we'll have to talk about big projections for some other reason. Okay. But the difficult part of uh, uniform rectifiability will, will not do, but I claim it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so that's all the definitions, the theorems we want to prove. Then uh, let's try to start doing little proofs. Okay. So let me be put myself in co-dimension one, because things are easier, and try to prove the upper bound for Alphos regularity. Okay, so you give yourself a ball, and you want to estimate uh, the size of a set in the ball. And here I'm saying that we have this estimate, which will actually be easy, 
which is cost of measure of a set in the ball is less than the, so omega n minus one is the measure of a unit disk in Rd, uh, in this case d is equal to n minus one, times R to the n minus one, plus the error term coming from almost minimal. And, okay, I mean I can try to hide what's going to happen, but it doesn't matter so much. So, you know, suppose the set is really, you know, lots of mass here. You're in this ball. Uh, this is clearly not uh, almost minimal. You can do better than that. Uh, for instance, what can you do which is better than that? You'll keep, you know, I anyway, you'll have to uh, find a competitor in this ball, okay? And here is a competitor which is clearly as good. So a competitor in this ball means that whatever is outside, you keep the same. And here, all this mess here, uh, essentially you replace it by Yes, yeah, so I'll try to continue in red, although it doesn't work so well. You know, and I'm cheating, uh, in this case, I think it's like this. Maybe it's going to be a subset of a sphere, okay? So, if I can prove that the red thing here is a competitor for my initial guy, a uh, deformation of the initial guy, I win because uh, the measure of this thing here is exactly uh, omega to the n minus one, r to the n minus one, okay? Now, why is it a competitor? That's not so hard. So this set still is as finite measure locally, so it's easy to find uh, of dimension n minus one, so it's uh, fairly easy to find a point here. So if I find a point here, well, I mean, then I will prove my point of the time before, and what I will do is I will essentially use a radial projection, okay? And I'll change colors to so this was the red for was for the estimate, and I essentially project all the things that I had in here on the boundary. So the projection is going to be a deformation because I could go, I could interpolate between the two, and what I will get rather than what I said is this part, right? And maybe a little bit of that part here. Okay, even a subset, so it's even better. Okay, so that's my first proof of the day. Uh, very impressive. Uh, <laughs> All right. Okay. Ah, so in fact, in this case, I can use any arbitrary point which is not on the set, so that the thing is defined. The point that I chose was more clever than another point, which was, you know, I hesitated, I hesitated a little bit. I could have taken this point here, and I would have, I mean, it would be, have been a little bit more stupid because I would have obtained the whole sphere, but not so much but any point will do uh, for the argument. Okay. So that's fine and it's working well because you're in codimension one and the Hostoff measure of codimension one of a sphere is finite. And of course if you are in codimension larger than one and you try to do this estimate, it does not work, right? So this is, uh, so yeah, so this is the bottom of a transparency, so what should we do now? And the answer is that there is a well-known technique that was introduced a long time ago, which is the Federer-Fleming projection, that was probably introduced by Federer and Fleming on their paper, uh, in their paper about, you know, it, it's a paper about uh, currents. What I will do is I will take exactly the same construction as they have, make it, make it for sets, I hope it becomes a little simpler, and use it many times. So. Today will be a lecture about the Federer Fleming projection, okay? And this is the right way to solve this problem about you know, projecting on the sphere, and then uh, you, ha you have a set, you don't know how to estimate it, and so on and so forth, okay? I, I fear light, so <laughs> I think I'll go here again. So, Again, Federer Fleming projections, and I decided to cut the construction into many little pieces, I think three of them, uh, because it sounds easier. Okay, yeah. Uh, you could try to do uh, all those things at the same time, but let me try this way. 
So I will do a Federer Fleming in some given face. Uh, face means face of a cube, and the face will be k-dimensional, I think. At least it will have a dimension which is strictly larger than d, the dimension of our, our sets. Okay? So I give myself a cube, uh, which I suppose is called Q. I give my set a set F. Usually uh, F is the intersection of a cube. All my cubes will be closed, by the way. So usually it's the intersection of a cube by some, with some set. I'll just say that the set is contained in the cube. It could have a part on the boundary, so this is my set F. Okay. Uh, so, and I want to project the set on the boundary of a cube. And the idea of a Federer Fleming projection is that once this is done, I will do it again. But let's do just one step. So we pick one point. So to make things, uh, to make the geometry a uh, little bit easier, I will always take my center near the middle of a cube, because uh, this way I control the geometry of projections. I pick a point Xi here. And again, the point Xi, I, I try to take it outside of a set F. Okay. For the moment, it's easy because my, uh, among my assumptions, I think I have the fact that the Hostov measure of a set uh, Y. OK, well, anyway. Uh, Usually my set is as dimension D and the face is of a larger dimension. There will be an exception uh, later and that's the reason why my slide doesn't say what I expected it to say. But nevertheless, there is always room to, point a point, uh, to find a point Xi outside of a set F and that's where you protect, okay? Usually it's because this set has dimension strictly less than the dimension of the face. And from time to time, it's because the Hostov measure of this set has measure less than one-tenth of a measure of that uh, half square. And you project. So you project radially in the way uh, you would imagine. Okay? Start from uh, Xi and any point, for instance, this point here will be projected to that point there, which is the, okay, the point of the boundary of a cube, which is on the same line. So for instance, the new set that I get here is going to be, of course, the picture is easy if I take a set which is large enough. Uh, OK, something like this. All right? That's step number one. Uh, but I want to control the house of measure of the images because that's what I'd like to do. And there are uh, two ways to control this. There is a the simple way which doesn't always work. The simple way is to say, OK, look, I pick this point Xi, and uh, I look near, sorry, near here, and I'm trying to find what is the Lipschitz uh, constant for the mapping that sends a point here to a point there, OK? And you see that if a point is close enough to a boundary, the mapping is essentially going to be one Lipschitz, maybe 10 Lipschitz because there is a corner here or because the, the center Xi was here and I'm sort of projecting sideways, but I don't lose more than a constant. And the second bad thing that can happen is that the point here was very close to Xi, like for instance for this point. And near this point, the mapping is not something like 10 Lipschitz, maybe it's 10 multiplied by the inverse of the distance here, normalized by the distance here. Okay, so that's what I have on my thing here. The first estimate is Again, uh, you know, the projection near a point is diameter of Q divided by the distance, Lipschitz, times a constant. And so the obvious estimate would be that the Hostov measure of a projection, pi uh, Xi, is going to be the Hostov measure of a set that I started with multiplied by the Lipschitz constant to the power d, which is what I have up there. Okay? That's usually not the best estimate. Okay. Okay. But it works when the set is under control. So, for instance, as soon as we know that the, uh, our set is alpha regular, we'll be able to find points that are here that are far from the set, and we'll be able to do that. But, uh, for instance, at the beginning of the arguments, we don't know that. Uh, again, it could be that the set is 
sort of epsilon dense, like before. And if a set is epsilon dense, uh, you're not going to be able to use this estimate the same way. Yet, on average, when you take psi an average point, uh, things sort of average out, and what you will have anyway is that the Hausdorff measure of a projection is less than c times the uh, Hausdorff measure of the initial set, okay? By a Fubini argument that I will do in one second, okay? So again, at, uh, the map is not going to be Lipschitz with uniform constants, but uh, when you average, uh, it will act as if it was Lipschitz. That's what's going to happen. And I have uh, the argument for the proof, so let's go for it very slowly. Uh, so I want to prove this uh, globally. So what happens is that I will just average on Xi in the half cube, and uh, I forget about the set F, okay? But it's an average, host of measure of the measure of a projection. So I repeat the average here, and then I write down the host of measure of the projection, and I write it's the integral on F of the Lipschitz constant, local Lipschitz constant to the power D, integrated against measure, okay? And the Dixie measure is just the average that I was talking about. Okay, right. So then uh, when you have a double integral and you don't know what to do, you use Fubini, so let's do that. Uh, so this is the same thing, except that now I'm integrated, I'm integrated in Xi for a given X, uh, the same story here. And what happens is that this distance of uh, diameter, don't pay attention to it, it's just a normalization. You could have decided it was one. In the, so you have one over X minus Xi to the power D, and the face is at least d plus one dimensional, that's the way I required it, okay? Uh, the result is that this integral converges. The normalization says that the integral uh, makes some of the diameter disappear, and what you get is c times the diameter to some power, and then host of measure uh, of you know, this set, okay, the measure of this set, uh, and again, uh, things work out. Fine, okay? I hope I'm not, uh, maybe this, this sounds fishy to me and I'm not able to uh, read correctly, but what I'm saying is that the important part here was that the integral inside was converging no matter what the point X was to something which was bounded. And then afterwards what you, you're supposed to recuperate is the measure of a set F that you started with. No, I think it's fine, okay. Right, so again, on average, uh, things will be acting as if it was C Lipschitz with some constant, and that's what we want, okay? And maybe some, you know, some pieces of a set, so let's say here, of course, this, this looks, uh, this one looks small, but of course it will end up being large, but it doesn't matter, right? It's on average, okay. That was uh, step one of Federer Fleming. Step two is you do it again, okay? Let's try, and I have a long story here about repeating the thing. So I st 